a great pleasure to be here in uh, this in this college, in the city which my Canadian mother called Toronto the Good. Um, so it's, um, and thank you for coming today. I'm going to begin with a, um, a sort of apologia to say I don't teach preaching. I'm not a weekly preacher, and I never have been, um, though almost all of my teaching is directed in some way toward preaching. Uh, what I'm going to be doing with these, with these lectures, meditations, is focusing on my own favorite preaching texts, the Psalms. Um, but my main focus is on reading the Psalms, and then we'll have time for a conversation possibly following each of the meditations, if not later on, um, in the, the day, uh, we'll have opportunity to talk about how what I'm saying may bear directly on your relationship as preachers. Um, I'll begin with a sort of Anglican observation, uh, although I realize not all of us are Anglicans, but from in Anglican worship, all of us pray the Psalms, or at least a portion of the Psalms, every day. So the Psalms are liturgically indispensable to Anglicans. But what I want to explore today is how the Psalms are indispensable in a somewhat different way, both existentially and ecclesially indispensable. Why we cannot do without the Psalms and still be who we really are in relation to God. In my experience teaching now in seminaries, theological colleges over uh, more than 30 years, that is a question we do not talk enough about who are we, Coram Deo, in relationship to God? I hope that the work that we'll do today will be useful to you in the short term um, as you think about the preaching you may be, or teaching you may be doing over Lent in the coming weeks. So I'm going to keep in view psalms that are, at least in the Revised Common Lectionary, appointed for the Lenten season, but I will also be extending beyond those psalms. The title of this session is my starting place, Entering the World of the Psalms. I doubt it would have occurred to me to use that phrase, entering the world of, for any other biblical book apart from the psalms. There's something special about the Psalter. One feels that one is entering into, if you become immersed in it, one feels one is entering into a distinctive way of looking at the world. George Steiner, who has just died in the last couple of weeks, says, no Western idiom after the Psalms and Homer has found the world so new. I might quibble with that. I think it's doubtful that the Psalms are really speaking in Western idi idiom, unless you count ancient West Asia as Western idiom. Um, but I would agree with Steiner's main point. The Psalms look at the world in a fresh way, so fresh that it is sometimes raw. Um, I'm thinking of the imprecatory psalms, the psalms that call down curses upon the psalmist's enemies, um, psalms that are fairly rarely heard in liturgy, but we'll be looking at one of them today. So the psalms are fresh in the sense that you feel the psalmist is often sensing her way, using language to say something that is not yet fully settled in her own mind. 
I'll venture a theory. Poetry is the best language to use when you are feeling your way with words. I'll suggest two different ways of doing theology so you can see why I think that is important to us as theologians. When you're trying to make a certain point or an argument, then discursive prose is quite likely the best way to do that. And, of course, that's the way Christians in the West, at least, have normally written theology in discursive prose, in paragraphs, okay, in essay form. But when you are not so much making an argument as exploring experience, when you are gasping with surprise or gratitude or rage or exhaustion, then you may have little choice but to use poetic language for what you have to say. And I think that is often the psalmist's situation. They're feeling their way in new terrain, new emotional, intellectual, spiritual terrain. And in these meditations, we're going to try to follow some of that exploration. A remarkable midrash, um, a Jewish um, exposition of scripture. I just said a moment ago that Western uh, theologians have normally worked in discursive prose. This is not true in Jewish tradition. Um, where the language, it may be prose, as you'll see that this is in a certain way, um, but it's a kind of imaginative poetic prose. And this particular midrash is pointing to the indispensability of poetry and the Psalms in particular. So it begins with a divine statement a supposed divine statement. Uh, Were it not for the poetry and song that all flesh and blood recite before me, I would not have created the world. And whence do we know that the Holy One, blessed be he, only created the world on account of poetry and song? From the verse which says, quoting the Psalms, honor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty, are in his sanctuary. That is to say, honor and majesty are before him in the heavens, but strength and beauty arise from his sanctuary on earth. Playing with the uh, bicolon uh, structure of the Psalms. And whence do we know that the Holy One, blessed be he, created the heavens for the matter of poetry? from the verse which says, again quoting from the Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God. And whence do we know that Adam opened his mouth in a song of praise, from the verse which says, a psalm, a poem for the Sabbath day. Um, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praise to thy name, O Most High. Adam is traditionally regarded as the author of Psalm 92, which is quoted here. The idea that Adam is the author of a psalm would seem to suggest what? Well, if you're thinking in Hebrew, as the rabbis are, it would suggest that every ben Adam every son, child of Adam, every human being, is also a poet. And that suggests that poetry is not so much a special gift as I think we tend in this culture to think of it. Some people write poetry, some people get poetry, and most of us don't. Uh, but from the perspective of this midrash, poetry is not a special gift. It's a part of our natural human endowment. As ben Ad Bnei Adam, children of Adam, 
So let's dwell for a moment on what that means for us. The very fact that the Psalms are placed in the Bible as, you might say, the common prayer of ancient Israel, that suggests that every Israelite, and by extension, every Jew, every Christian, is properly a poet to some extent. Their future, their further placement in the Book of Common Prayer and I think other books of worship, the Methodist Book of Worship, for instance, which I use with some regularity, has, I think, not all of the Psalms, but most of them in it. Uh, so their placement in our books of worship suggests that our ancestors agreed with that judgment that every Christian is a poet to some extent, and considered these ancient poems to be the best guide and vehicle for prayer. It is doubtful that any of my Anglican ancestors, at least, knew this midrash, but they intuited that God has a special affinity for poetry. It's intriguing to me, it may be a coincidence, that in my tradition, at least, the church has read the Psalms mostly in the morning and the evening, the beginning of the day, the end of the day, also in our night prayers, so morning prayer, evening prayer, Compline. That's when I read them, which is to say I'm reading the Psalms most of the time when I'm either tired at the end of the day or not yet fully awake. Not, not yet in, you might say, a, pr a discursive prose mode, which is where, where I do most of my work, my lecturing, my writing. Um, or I'm past that mode. I'm ready to go to sleep. Um, I'm slowed down, not cranked up. Um, and in those chinks, you might say, of my day, a poem can find an opening in my mind and begin to open me to a different way of looking at the world and my own experience of it. So let's begin by noting a couple of consistent characteristics of these biblical poems that enable us to enter into the world of the psalmist. The first of them I'm calling theocentricity. Um, it, to choose maybe a slightly more poetic phrase, centripetal force. I'm just beginning work um, on a set of meditations on the Psalms which will accompany a set of paintings on the Psalms by uh, Japanese-American painter Makoto Fujimura and we're planning to call that book Centripetal Force. Uh, the point is that the psalmists are seeking the center, uh, the Latin meaning of centripetal, and for them, the center is God. Almost every psalm begins by naming God, uh, and almost always God is named in direct relationship to the psalmist. Uh, Psalm 51, we'll be looking at that in a few minutes. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your, your chesed, your covenant love. Uh, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me again in relationship to the psalmist? But the fact that the psalmist most often speaks in the first person, often the first person singular, should not deceive us into thinking that the center of interest in the Psalms is little me. It is God who stands at the center of the psalmist's world, and that is why the Psalter as a whole is called in Hebrew, tilim, praisings. These praisings are not simple poems of self-expression. They are fundamentally other-directed, as praise is. And I think this marks a significant difference in our mindset from that of the psalmist. Uh, 
the psalmist, the, sorry, God is often for us, I hate to say it, but I think it's true, an abstraction. Even if religion is our profession. But the psalmist reads the world wholly in relation to God. And that theocentric reading constitutes an important hermeneutical principle in approaching this te these texts. Always look for what the psalm is saying about God. And when you're preaching them, always speak about what the psalm is saying about God. What perception, what characterist characterization of God is found here and then secondarily, how that shapes my life, human life. It seems to me, again, thinking of Anglican tradition, it seems to me that this is exactly what the collects from our, our prayer book do. O oh God, who is the author of peace and lover of concord and knowledge of whom standeth eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, we pray. So beginning with who God is, a, some basic characteristic of God, and then moving to what that means for human life. It might be an interesting exercise through Lent to attempt to write that kind of a prayer, that kind of collect, speaking of the attributes of God as you hear them in a given psalm. So God stands at the center of the psalmist's world, but one can say more, that God is the God whose attention is riveted on us. God is, is shomer tefillah, as Psalm 65 says, the one who hears prayer. That phrase appears only in Psalm 65, actually, but it's a conviction that runs all the way through the Psalms. So a basic assumption of the Psalms is that God cares intensely about what we experience in this world. God gives ear to our, our cries. God gives genuine pleasure, takes genuine pleasure in our praise. The psalmists are convinced that tilim, the human act of rendering praise, is a kind of essential force in the world. Even if that praising rather frequently takes the form of loud complaint. Nonetheless, it is indispensable to the dynamics, you might say, of the divine economy, of how God relates to the creatures. Another characteristic of the Psalms, they depict a world very often of sharp contrasts. We see the contrast that dominates the whole Psalter already in the first psalm. And I've given you, I've given you the first psalm on your sheet. Uh, we won't go through all of it now, but I want to focus on that final verse. And what I'm trying to do in these translations, I'm not trying to be poetic, so to speak, at least uh, by our conventions of poetry. I'm trying to be as transparent as I can to the Hebrew. Um, we can talk later if you want about translating the Psalms, because I think if you grew up as I did with, um, with the Coverdale Psalter, which is quite mellifluous, um, and then you read the Psalms in Hebrew, it's kind of a kick in the teeth. Um, so uh, they're much more stark. Anyway, but that final verse of Psalm 1, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the, of the wicked vanishes. At least the contemporary Book of Common Prayer um, in the U.S. Uh, renders that final phrase, <clears throat> the verb, the way of the wicked is doomed. I think um, there's a real difference, it seems to me, between saying the way of the wicked vanishes mm 
it's, it's lost. It's the common Hebrew word for something that you thought was on your desk not being there anymore. Okay? That's it. Um, that's quite different. I think is doomed is over translation. Do you see the difference between those? It's the way of the, of the wicked. It's not necessarily that God has it in for them, that something awful is going to happen. It just doesn't have any substance. Okay. Um, the psalm seems to describe a world, this whole psalm, that is peopled exclusively by two kinds of folks, the righteous and the wicked. There's no gray, gray area at all in this first psalm. And I think the reason for that is that because people in extremis often do not see the world in shades of gray. Uh, the psalmists are very commonly in extremis. They're surrounded by numerous and powerful enemies. Psalm 3, which is really the first prayer in the Psalter, begins, Adonai, Lord, Mahrabu, Tzachai, how many enemies I have. It's a lament of the individual spoken in the first person singular. These are the most common form of prayer altogether in the Bible. Would most people know that from going to church on Sunday? That laments are the most common single form of prayer in the Bible? Not in my tradition, Sunday worship. I'm curious, would are laments, for those of you in the room in your different translation, do laments show up often on a Sunday morning? Okay. Um, but the psalmist reminds us that we have a lot of enemies, and they are real. But an interesting and critical point, I think, for our use of the psalms is that in the psalmist's world, direct vengeance is not an option. The psalmist never says, I'm an American, okay? The psalmist never says, I'm going to get me a gun. Okay? It's not an option. Not because the psalmists are philosophically opposed to vengeance, they certainly are not, but because, as Andre Sharaki says, the psalmist's hands are empty. The psalmist has no weapons. Because remember, ancient Israel was often on the losing side of any conflict that it was in. I think if these psalms came to us from one of the great empires, from Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, maybe the psalmist's hands wouldn't always be empty. But uh, coming from the place where they do, the psalmist, when he thinks of his enemies, then he thinks not of his own personal vengeance, but rather, who's going to deliver me? And there's only one option. So we're back to the theocentricity of the Psalms. The laments always appeal to God for deliverance. But if you are praying about deliverance from your enemies, even if you're hoping for God's vengeance upon them, as the imprecatory Psalms do, then you are committing your opponents into God's hands. And who can say, what will happen to them or us there. The presence of sharp contrasts make it all the more crucial to look for how these psalms express the subtlety of our life with God. I've spoken about that a little bit already in this very last line, the way of the wicked vanishes, disappears. But let's go back to the line before it. The Lord <clears throat> knows the way of the righteous. Uh, again, looking at one of the contemporary translations, it says the Lord rewards the way of the righteous. Righteous. 
But the psalmist doesn't say that. Nor does it say, the Lord makes their way smooth. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. It's a really interesting verb choice. What it suggests, I think, is the righteous are identifiable. Uh, not because they live externally great lives. The prevalence of lament in the Psalter indicates that is not the case. Uh, not even because they always do the right thing. But because God knows them. God holds them in the divine mind. Righteousness in the Bible, staka in Hebrew tzedek, um, righteousness in the Bible is primarily a matter of relationships, relationships on the, both the vertical and the horizontal level. It's a matter of having fruitful relationships with both God and neighbor. And that notion of righteousness is well captured in the first metaphor in the psalm. It's in verse 3, um, speaking of the righteous person. He is like a tree planted beside water channels, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves do not wither, and everything he does prospers. Um, the, uh, as you know, the land of Israel is a semi-arid land, so trees stand out in the landscape as a place where, if you're traveling, you know that you can find water and shade there. That's what the righteous person is like. The person, and the tree, sorry, the tree is like Torah. The righteous person who is a student of God's Torah, God's teaching, um, is like a tree planted in a well-watered place. So the righteous are those who are in the first instance recipients of grace. And any good that they do comes from that solid planting. The distinctive mark of the righteous, then, is the coherence of their lives. And that, I think, is what is expressed in the phrase, God knows the way of the righteous. They lead lives that have enough cohesiveness to stick in the mind of God, in contrast to the way of the wicked, which just blows away like chaff in the wind, leaving no, no nourishment, unlike the fruit tree planted by streams of water, no nourishment for neighbors, no lasting impression, it would perhaps in God's mind. That at least seems to be the perspective of the psalmist. I think of a young priest in New York City years ago saying to me with a hint of sadness, the norm for the people I serve in this city is some form of chaos. The norm for the people I serve is some kind of chaos. The psalmist world, by contrast, is ordered by the intense focus on God. The heaven-bent pursuit of God as the only reliable source of sanity in a world that is largely chaotic or hostile. Such sharp contrasts might seem naive, even intolerable. It's just not that simple. They would be intolerable if the psalmist were aspiring to write doctrinal statements, maybe even if the psalmists were prose writers, if they were trying to make an argument. But the psalmists are lyric poets. 
So they're just offering us flashes of insight. They're not even narrative poets. We'll talk about the narrativity of the Psalms in a little while. But these lyric poems, poems are just offering us moments of insight into our life with God, moments of feeling. As we pray our way through the we are passing our we are passing through the different emotions that should be part of our life with God if we are bringing our whole life honestly before God. If we are using the Psalms, as Calvin called them, as an anatomy of all parts of the human soul. There are in this world of the psalmist some few constants. The rea reality of God, the persistence of trouble, but the mood in relation to those changes. Sometimes the psalmist is identifying with the righteous, beleaguered and defensive. Sometimes the psalmist imputes all righteousness to God and claims none for herself. The psalmist is aware at times of having let God down, Psalm 51 being an outstanding example. Sometimes the psalmist feels let down by God. We'll look at that later on too. So these poems give us huge latitude for prayer. And using that latitude well is a responsibility. It requires discernment and skill. Part of the art of praying and preaching the Psalms is to know which Psalm fits this moment. And if you get to a psalm that does not seem to express your feeling today, your situation right now, and doubtless you will, then ask, for whom should I be praying this? What is the constant that binds that person or those people and me together, coram deo, before God? And that constant is invariably to be found in the character of God. I said that, the, that poetry is a kind of speaking that still has, or at least the poetry of the Psalms, is a kind of speaking that still has in it some rawness. Not all the edges have been smoothed off. The Psalms are, you might say, edgy poetry. Um, so let's look at one of them that we'll be reciting uh, in just eight days, Psalm 51. And again, I've given you my translation of it. Uh, but I'll read you just uh, the first bit. The Psalm is um, the superscription, the editorial note at the beginning of the choir master, a David psalm, when Nathan the prophet came to him as he had come to Bathsheba. Be gracious to me, O Lord, according to your chesed, your covenant love, according to your abundant mercies, blot out my transgressions. Completely cleanse me from my wrongdoing and from my sin, make me pure. For my transgressions I know, and my sin is before me always. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and what is evil in your eyes I have done. So you are right in your sentence uh, and clear when you render judgment. Yes, in iniquity I was birthed, and in sin my mother conceived me. Yes, truthfulness you desire in hidden, hidden places, and in what is concealed you impart to me wisdom. Take sin from me with hyssop so I may be pure. Wash me so I am cleaner than snow. Let me hear gladness and rejoicing. Let the bones you have crushed be jubilant. Hide your face from my sins and all my wrongdoings blot out. A pure heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit 
renew within me. You might also translate that. It's a pretty strong Hebrew phrase, renew in my core. It's an exceedingly familiar psalm, of course, but we shouldn't let that keep us from seeing its strangeness. This abject confession of sin is, within the context of the Psalter, an outlier. We don't hear much lament over sin in the Psalms. Other Psalms do acknowledge sin, Psalm 32, Psalm 38, Psalm 40, we'll be looking at a couple of those today, but they acknowledge sin mostly in passing. Uh, Yes, of course, I'm human, I sin, but not with the kind of abject self-censure that we hear in Psalm 51. The lament Psalms focus not on my sin, but rather on my suffering at the hands of my enemies, as I've said, and sometimes at the hand of God. But here, and here we get that here, let the bones you, God, have crushed be jubilant. I'm suffering at the hands of God. But here, the emphasis is distinctly on the fact that I have brought that suffering upon myself. And it is the end, my sense of failure is directed toward God. Against you only have I sinned. The language here is so strong. I was conceived in sin. Is that exaggeration? Self-hatred? Maybe. Or is it a recognition that I did not myself create all the conditions of my sin. Ours is a sick society. I am implicated in something much bigger than I am. This is poetry. You can read that line either way. And in either case, whether it is an ex... we might say exaggerated expression of self-contempt, or whether it is a recognition of the larger context of my sin, there is tension in the central relationship. On the one hand, I have hurt God, and God has hurt me back, the bones you have broken. So that's the one hand, And on the other hand, I am still God's covenant partner. God's chassid, the language that not this psalm but other psalms use, uh, bound with God in a relationship of mutual chesed, covenant loyalty. And so that is the basis of my appeal to God. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your chesed, your covenant love, verse 3. Therefore, my hope lies in God's capacity and willingness to make me radically different than I now am. As I was preparing this meditation, a new question came to my mind. It probably should have occurred to me decades ago. Um, I begin morning prayer, uh, so most, I begin most mornings, with a line from this psalm, Psalm 17, O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Um, By the way, Jews also begin morning prayer with that same, not begin, it's not the opening line of the morning prayer service in the synagogue, but it is the opening line of the main prayer, the Amidah, the standing prayer, um, that's the center of every Jewish prayer service virtually. Um, So Jews and Christians normally uh, say this line as we enter into prayer. Here's my question. Are we meant to hear that verse in isolation, as I generally have done? It's just, it's time to pray. Lord, open my lips. My mouth shall proclaim your praise. Or 
is the larger context of that psalm meaningful? Does it matter that that line comes from Psalm 51? Liturgically speaking, I think it's quite likely that we are meant to hear the psalm in isolation. Uh, as you know, liturgy is, I realize that Bishop Stephen is a liturgist, so I'm a bit, bit nervous here, but I'm going to jump right out there. You can correct me later. Um, liturgy is opportunistic with respect to the Bible. Um, it's opportunistic and atomistic. Um, those, that's not negative. You might say that liturgy speaks the language of the Bible, so it's always speaking it in remix. Okay? And you're not always meant to be thinking about the original context of every, every given phrase or um, verse. But what if, as a Lenten discipline, we were to take that line, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise, what if we were to take that line in the context of this whole psalm? So think what that means about how we enter into morning prayer. Um, you might say implicitly saying, God, I present myself before you without pretense. Um, I, I come into prayer with a loss of innocence about myself. That's the condition with which I stand before you on a daily basis. Look at how the psalm ends immediately after that line. For you do not desire sacrifice, or I would have given it. Burnt offering you do not favor Godly sacrifices, a broken spirit, a broken and crushed heart, O oh God, you do not despise. Putting then Psalm 17, uh, verse 17 in context, my refusal, in the context of the whole psalm, my refusal to think better of myself than I am, that is my daily offering to God. That is uh, the offering of a broken and crushed heart, the most precious thing I have to give. Going back to the editorial note at the preface to the psalm uh, that associates Psalm 51 with David after the encounter with Nathan. That association with David bespeaks a, what you might call, narrativizing impulse, putting the psalm in the context of a larger story. And we have it a number of times, as you know, in the Psalter, most often in the context of David's life, because David is the person we know best in um, in Hebrew scripture, at least. He has the fullest biography of anyone in the Old Testament. Um, so we embed these words in David's life, and we know we can imagine the situations in which we might embed them in our own. So I think that that narrativizing impulse is a very, um, I think it's a good impulse for praying the Psalms, um, and it's for me, it often inspires how I preach the Psalms. Uh, I associate them with a human life, not always David's life. Um, you'll hear in a few minutes, I'll uh, choose another biblical character. Um, and sometimes I embed them in a typical human life, including my own. Although if I and this is certainly something I learned from John Donne. Um, the Psalms were John Donne's favorite preaching texts um, in the 17th century. Donne would often speak, as the psalmist does, in the first person singular. But the first person singular was for him, uh, his eye was a very expansive eye. Uh, 
it was meant to include everybody in the room. He was not telling us, he was not giving us a lot of autobiographical information. Uh, very rare for them to do. And frankly, I think it should be more rare for contemporary preachers than it often is, but that's, that's for a later conversation. Um, what I want to do in ending this meditation um, is give you another poem alongside it, a contemporary poem by Robert Hess, who was a recent poet laureate uh, in the US. Um, I set it alongside Psalm 51 because I think it covers some of the same ground. And Robert uh, Hass had a Roman Catholic uh, education through uh, school and college and taught at a Roman college, Catholic college for many years. So I think it's not coincidence. Perhaps, maybe he didn't have Psalm 51 in mind, but I think that there is a certain, you might say, gospel narrative in both testaments that he has in mind. Uh, I've given you an excerpt from this poem. It's a long poem, uh, but on page two of your handout, I've given you an excerpt from it. Um, before I read it, I'm going to give you part of what I excerpted. It's not what I omitted from my excerpt, um, the larger narrative of this poem, uh, Faint Music. It's about a bad breakup in San Francisco. Um, and the guy who's been ditched for another guy prepares, to, he drives to the Golden Gate Bridge preparing to jump off. And he climbs into the, onto the girder that is below the bridge. I don't think you can do this now, but when I was growing up, it was possible. Um, climbed onto the girder below the bridge. And then a quirky thought comes to his mind as he's you know, um, poised over the bay. He wonders suddenly, very San Franciscan thing to wonder, I'm a San Franciscan. Um, why do we say seafood instead of land food? Okay, we never say land food, but we say seafood all the time. This imponderable question occupies his attention until he falls asleep. Some hours later, he wakes up. He doesn't want to die now. He climbs very carefully out of the girder, gets into his car, and goes home to his empty house and starts the rest of his life. Uh, and this is Hass reflecting upon that story as it was told to him by a friend. The friend said to him, maybe you need to write a poem about grace. When everything broken is broken and everything dead is dead, and the hero has looked into the mirror with complete contempt. And the heroine has studied her face and defects remorselessly. And the, the pain they thought might, as a token of their earnestness, release them from themselves, has lost its novelty and not released them. And they have begun to think kindly and distantly, watching the others go about their days, likes and dislikes, reasons, habits, fears. They've begun to think that self-love is the one weedy stalk of every human blossoming, and understood, therefore, why they had been all their lives in such a fury to defend it. And that no one, except some almost inconceivable saint in his pool of poverty and silence can escape this violent, automatic life's companion ever. Maybe then, ordinary light, faint music under things, a hovering like grace appears. That's the point then in the story when he, it, that's the point in the poem where he tells the story I've just told you about the breakup. And then these are the final lines, I've put them there. I had the idea that the world's so full of pain 
it must sometimes make a kind of singing. And that the sequence helps as much as order helps. First an ego, and then pain, and then the singing. First an ego, and then pain, and then the singing. Isn't that the same sequence that Psalm 51 traces? David is one of the towering egos in the Bible. David, who seems to feel no pain his whole life long until Nathan confronts him. And then suddenly David feels the utter brokenness, as Hass puts it, when everything broken is broken. First an ego, and then pain, and then the singing. Hass creates a narrative within his poem. The editors of the Psalter have given us a narrative outside the poem itself with that superscription. They've given us the backstory. Psalm 51 is a prayer. Hass's poem is not. But nonetheless, both of them show something of the dynamic of how self-hatred, or in Dave, David's case, pathological self-absorption, yields to a measure of grace. <laughs> 